Matthew 11, 28. Jesus speaking. Uh, there's so many fine points in this um, uh, text. There is an invitation. There is an illustration. There is an explanation. There is an application. There is a promise. There is a challenge to action. And there are benefits. All in these few phrases. Jesus said, come. You have somebody to go to. Come unto me. All ye that labor. Not some, all. Total. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I personally will give you rest. You've got something to take. Take my yoke upon you. You've got something to learn. And learn of me. For I am meek. I am not weak. I am meek and lowly in heart. And you've got something to find. You shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus was, do you know, have you noticed in the scripture that nobody ever called Jesus by his name? Nobody. Nobody ever said, hey Jesus, oh brother Jesus, or, never. Once some Greeks came to Philip and said, sir, we would like to see Jesus. But other than that, nobody called him by his name. They called him by titles. And one of the, one of the main uh, titles was Rabbi or Rabboni, meaning master teacher. So here, he's giving us some lessons. And my topic is lessons from the master teacher. We need to learn these lessons because we take them for granted. Just like me. When I was 12 years old, my poor parents sent me to a Catholic high school. They had to pay $15 a month, which they couldn't afford. But my mother went to the priest and begged for me to come uh, for free. The priest was good. I was a Hindu boy. Priest didn't care. He said, okay, let him come. 12 years old, 13, 14, 15. Three years I went to school. I had textbooks. I had teachers. I had lessons. I went regularly. Monday to Friday. I had one little short khaki pants. And one blue shirt and you had to wear a tie. I've been tying ties since I was 12 years old. Until I get wafer tie, but you don't know what wafer tie is. For those three years, I faithfully went to school. I read the books, but guess what? I learned nothing. I was a vagabond in class. While the teacher was teaching, I was rapping on the bed on the desk. Just like some people come to church, the preacher's preaching, they're watching their phone and they're on the internet. This is my point. People come to church. They read the Bible. They got the text. They got the teacher. But very few of them are not learning anything. Not learning. Pentecostals are noted for not learning. They depend on the spirit. They expect the anointing to come and to fill their mouth, quoting Psalms, saying, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. The only place that happens now is in the dentist's office. <laughs> you got to study the word to show yourself approved. You have to. You've got to learn the scriptures. He said to them, you err, you err. Because you know not the scriptures. And that's where we make our mistakes. So, my sub is loading but not learning. What do I mean by that? If you had a half ton pickup truck, and as you travel, you see everybody garbage, and you start to take stuff. 
and pack it on your pickup. Soon you'll be overloaded. Soon people will recognize that you're a good person and they will bring garbage for you. And you will keep on loading it up because you're just a good person. And the thing you have not learned is when to say no. That's the biggest lesson the church have not learned yet. When to say no. Because we are good in heart and we have been taken advantage of. And we keep on saying, yes, I will do it. And you keep on adding. Adding load by load. People's load. You have your own load. You have your family. Your children's load. You have your job's load. But you keep adding, adding load. That's what I mean by loading and not learning. So how heavy is your load? You are yearning for help, but you are not learning from the master. And you will keep on burning with that until you learn. We just have to learn. And as we say back home, if you don't learn, you will burn. And so, so many believers are burning with the wrong fire. They are inflamed, not aflamed. They have this inner turmoil and restlessness. That's why he addressed the situation and said, I will, you will find rest unto your souls. There is that restlessness among believers. The dissatisfaction of empty church services. It's well, saying the re reality of Christ in you. Has not been fully realized. Topic lessons from the master teacher. Theme loading but not learning. He said come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. There is an invitation. Come to me. So the question is who do you go to? When you are heavy laden and overburdened and overwhelmed who do you go to as the first resort well the first things if you're on the five senses the first thing you will go to is somebody who you think can help you only to be disappointed because the answers they give you doesn't match what you're going on they're not prophetic enough to see your life and to speak from the heart of God to minister to you so that's why Jesus is inviting you personally. Come to me. I am able. I know the story. I have the answer. I can work the miracle. Come unto me. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I began it. I can finish it. Come to me. What an invitation. Hallelujah. Glory to God somebody. Come to me, all you that labor, you're, you're just laboring till you're tired. You're getting tired till you're fed up. You don't want to do good anymore. Because you've been tired of doing good and nothing seems to come back to you. Because the way you're looking for it to come back, it's not coming back. That way. It has many other ways to come back to you. If you see nothing happening to you but so many good things happening to your children, hey, it's coming back. Yeah. It's like a boomerang. You send it out and it will make a turn. It's coming back. Whatever you do is coming back to you. Yeah. Whatsoever, yeah. man. So that shall he also reap. Yeah. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You have an invitation to come. Now you have something to take. I remember back home. I just I was about 10 years, 8, 10, 12, 15. Around that time, our village was surrounded by sugarcane fields. El Dorado. It's named after Sir Walter Raleigh had found a huge chunk of gold in the Cora River. And they thought they had discovered El Dorado, the place of gold, and he named the village El Dorado. So I was a golden boy. 
As a matter of fact, my 40 years of uh, autobiographies on Kindle is called El Dorado's Gold. You can find it, you'll be surprised. I had some preachers read it and they said, I laughed, I cried, and I prayed. So, I grew up in El Dorado. 12, 13, 14. And what I noticed and what struck me very forcefully is how we had a Madrasi neighbor. He was from Madras. You know, all the Indians that came from India settled in this village. The, the British were very smart. They put different people from different states in the, in the villages so that they don't gang up. They, don't, they have to make friends. Some of them couldn't talk each other's language. My grandmother, who I grew up with for the first five years, was from Bihar. And I, she couldn't speak English. I, I learned Hindi at her feet. So, one thing that struck me was how this Madrasi gentleman, he had two bisons. I mean, they were big, huge. And I remember clearly the day he broke in the bison to go and load sugarcane. He had put one ring, metal ring in this side of the nose, and another ring on this side of the nose, and a yoke upon his neck, and two pieces of rope, and two men on the side, guiding this bison by pulling on the nose. He was so wild and so strong, he was kicking up and jumping, would break the cart. And I can still see these two men on the side, one pulling this side for him to go right, and the other pulling on the nose to go left. They were breaking him in. He was wild. So they put this yoke on his neck, a big heavy yoke, and he was trying to throw it off. Well, they went around the village block a few times, and by the time of one hour, that bison was so tame that they put a younger bison next to him and extended it's what I call a double yoke for him to now train the young bison who was kicking up as well. Amen. You see, the thing is, nobody likes yokes. No believer wants to be yoked. Paul calls some of his workers yoke fellows. Brethren who joined with him put their necks under the yoke that he was carrying and walked together for the kingdom of God. Jesus has a yoke for every believer. And he said, here's the problem. You went and made your own yoke. You went and yoke up yourself under somebody's ministry or some friendship or somebody's something. And all of a sudden, your yoke has gotten so heavy. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Where did you get that heavy burden from? It's because you loaded it up on yourself. God will not give you more than you can bear. You went and did that to yourself. You loaded yourself. You're loading, you're loading, and you keep on loading. And you have not learned the boundaries that will protect you. Take my yoke upon you that's the challenge put away your yoke give up your yoke today it's the anointing that will break the yoke and if you have a yoke that God did not give you let the anointing of God today come and break the yoke somebody said God doesn't break chain or break yokes he breaks chains and if you're yoked, let him break the chain. Are you going to take the challenge there? And give up your yoke. Because it's heavy. You can't carry it very long. You can't carry it very far. You will be screaming for help. And you wonder why everything is going wrong. And why the same thing is happening over and over again. I'll tell you why. When we went to school... 
if we didn't pass that test, they will repeat the exam. They will make you learn the lesson again and again until you get it right and until you pass the test. And the reason why some of us are going around in a cycle and re-experiencing uh, the same thing over and over and over is because we're not learning the lesson. And if you don't learn, you will burn. And he will keep on teaching to you until you learn. You don't have to clap. But give God the praise if you want to. You're learning. But you're not learning. And so he invites. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So who's your teacher? Who are you learning from? Who's your model? Where are you getting your examples from? I say get it from Jesus. Hallelujah. On Facebook when people ask me who I am. I said I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I plan to practice and do what he taught. I am a disciple of Jesus. I am not just a Christian nominally. I am a follower and a practicer of what Jesus taught. I believe in doing what I believe. Hallelujah. And why I'm telling you this is because I have made mistakes. I have never learned to put boundaries in my life. My emotions carried me. I always felt sorry for people. I always went out of the way, not just the second mile, the second hundred mile for people and made them happy to the point that I made my family uh, uncomfortable. And the last generation of pastors is guilty of uh, loving the church more than they love their families. In so much that pastors' children got to hate the church because the father pastor never had time to for their own family. No boundaries. We past generation work with a guilt complex. Oh, if we didn't see about the church and if we didn't take care of our people, we, they're going to bad talk us and, and we will look bad. Well, now I have crossed that boundary. I couldn't care what people have to say about me because I will give you my best. And when I give you my best, I leave the rest for God to do. And I think I've given my best, more than my best. My wife will tell you how many hours I sacrificed over the years. It's 32 years I'm pastoring this church. Giving, 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 giving. Learn from me. I didn't learn. I burnt. I came to the point where I was emotionally burnt. Came down with what is called emotional fatigue syndrome. That the slightest thing I did caused me grief. Yeah, doing good added to my pain. I just couldn't give anymore. You can't function and burn out. When you have no more oil in your lamp, you're burning the wick. The body pays the price when you don't have that strength inside of you. I am asking you to put boundaries in your life before it's too late. I'm not telling you to say no, but I'm telling you to learn when to say no. Can you give God the praise? Okay, I'm almost done. He said, learn from me. What are some of the models that Jesus, some of the things that Jesus modeled that we can learn from him? The first thing that strikes me with, with Jesus is, how he loved and how he encouraged people to love and how he preached about love taking up Deuteronomy love the Lord your God with all of your heart love him with all of your soul all of your might all of your strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself here's the problem we love ourselves so much that we don't care about the neighbor. That's why Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
He was a Samaritan, a stranger to the covenant of Israel. And, and Jesus used it to torture those religious Pharisees who were acting so well. And he gave the, the parable of this uh, wounded Israelite who left uh, Jerusalem going down to Jericho and fell among thieves. And, uh, and one priest passed by. Mm -mm. No, I, I, I can't touch him. He might be dead. That will dis, uh, I will be... Um, Disqualified. Religiosity has caused many people not to do the good they should. Because they're too religious. They're too cornered in the church and what the church says and what the church rules are. Hey, we need to be free from that. Not being rebellious or disobedient to authority, but have the freedom to love. There should be no brackets in the word love. Move the brackets. Love unconditionally. Love like Jesus. The first thing we have to do is learn to love. And I'll tell you why you have to learn it. Because it doesn't come automatically. I know it's a fruit of the spirit. But how is that done? God will put unlovable people in your life. God will put people that you really can't stand. And you wish they would go, but they wouldn't go because they are there to prove whether you have the love of God or not. And so you have to learn to love people. Because if you and I have our natural senses, there are a lot of people we wouldn't keep around us. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Learn to love. Learn from me how I love. They that crucified me, I love them. <laughs> Secondly, learn how to forgive. It's something hard to find in churches. People will shake your hand and pass you quickly. Because deep inside they still have you. And they still have the issue burning inside and they will not release it or let it go. To these kind of people, Jesus said, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. You look good on the outside. You smile well. You shake hands good. But inside of you have dead men's bones. How do dead men's bones get inside of you? Because you hold them, smother them, and kill them in your heart. And you have never given them up. I know people who have not forgiven their parents for 25 years. And parents have not forgiven their children and brothers have not forgiven their brothers for years and they will not talk to each other. Oh, learn to forgive. Learn from the master teacher. Because if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. He said it. Not only learn to give, but for, uh, learn to forgive, but learn how to deal with haters. Somebody tell me recently, Pastor, there are a lot of people who you think like you, but they don't. I didn't bother to question the person. I just figured that out to be true. And when you think that, oh, they, they love me, think again. Love is a simple word to say I love you. But when it's time for action, we need the action. Action will prove what you love. Pastor, we love you. Yeah, Pastor, we love you. Sister, we love you. Where is the action? Where is the action that follows love? Bless them that curse you. Can you do that? Or you curse them back right back. You think your mouth bad? My worst. You think you have a long tongue? I have a longer tongue. My tongue could reach hell and come back. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Hey, there are haters. And if I love haters because I just like to tickle them with good deeds. I like to confuse them. My wife said, why are you doing that? I say, I just love to do it. Get them confused. Get them mentally unbalanced because they're not expecting good from you when you, they know they're bad talk you. Just 
do good, man. Just do good. God is a record keeper. He holds the books and he will bless you no matter what they say about you. Learn how to deal with haters. Learn how to deal with pretenders and actors. You got a lot of them. Pretend. Oh, brother, I'm praying for you. Not a word went up to heaven on your behalf. <laughs> That's one of the most disgusting things I find in Facebook. Somebody will put up a prayer, a, a request for prayer. And everybody texts in, praying, praying. I doubt if anybody spent one minute on that request. Look, let's be honest. How about some reality? Oh, I forgot I didn't have the time. That's better than saying, yes, I prayed for you and you lied. We have to learn, just learn how to deal with them. Judas was the best pretender and the best actor they had in the 12. But Jesus learned how to love him, how to live with him, and how to deal with him. Number six, learn how to have compassion. We have empathy. Empathy is, oh, I feel sorry for you. Empathy, oh my gosh, I, I really wish I could do something. Yes, you can, but you wouldn't. Because you will not make the sacrifice of going into your bank and take an extra hundred dollars out and give it to somebody who desperately and truly needs it. See how quiet you got? <laughs> See how quiet you got? That's okay. I know what I'm talking about. I know it. I know it. If we don't act, compassion drives you to act. When Jesus saw the multitude, he had compassion on them. Because for three days they had followed him and had eaten nothing. And that's when he works his best miracle. When compassion is at work. Please, learn to have compassion. Learn how to walk in faith. We talk faith. We preach faith. Listen, I have been supervisor of over 350 pastors. I have helped 350 something pastors obtain their license from Foursquare. I know pastors. I had uh, about uh, 40 pastors in New York and I had 100 here. Supervising them for seven years. Let me tell you something about pastors. They don't have faith. Because every time they needed something, they would come to me. If they need a tire for the car, a battery, they need gas. Supervisor, I don't have money. I say, where is your faith? I'd already given them $22,000 to plant their church. And as soon as the money is finished, they keep coming back for more money. They preach faith, but they don't have it. You've got to learn to walk in faith. I see my brother, he's doing such a fantastic job posting up uh, some really fancy posts. And he put up this one. Some people are so wicked and evil. They see you walking on water. Instead of hailing the miracle, they say, what happened? You can't swim? <laughs> no matter what you do, They'll find fault and try to contradict your faith. But we walk by faith and not by sight. Let the people talk. You keep on the walk. How is that, Professor? <laughs> learn how to give. It's something you have to learn. It's okay to give a five bucks here and there. Now, let, let me just say something as I, I wasn't going to say this. But you know when you're giving your offering in this church? Please do not put a one dollar bill in an envelope. <laughs> because it, it costs us 15 cents for that envelope. We have to open the envelope with expectation. <laughs> and see one dollar in it. <laughs> Please just put your one dollar in the bag. Because when you 
wave this off, this, this envelope, the usher's getting the impression that you're putting something good in there. Don't do that. Just put your, we want your dollar. Get it right. It helps. You just drop it in the basket. And when you put in a $5, don't put your name and address. Why? Because everything written on that envelope has to go in the computer and be recorded on your name. It will not help you when tax time come. You already have $2,400 exemption. And if you don't cross that exemption, you can't claim. It's a waste of time to claim the, the donation you made. Learn how to give. If you give right, you will curse the blight. How is that, boy? Giving right will curse any blight. I have people here who can testify. They never tithe properly. And the moment they begin to tithe and give properly, God started to bless them. Yeah. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Yes. And finally, learn of me. Learn of me. The biggest example, the one thing that the disciples ask for. Not how to work miracles, not how to walk on water, not how to multiply bread, but Lord, teach us to pray. Amen. We have to learn to pray. Amen. Learn to pray. Many kinds of prayer. I can talk to you about the seven levels of prayer. I can also talk on the seven junctions of prayer. I've been a man of prayer all my life. Uh, when uh, I met Uterus, hmm. <laughs> that called for prayer. I didn't give you the full story the last time. I'll just take a minute there and then uh, we close up here. I sang a song for, but that song was true. Because, <laughs> because there was a, a friend of mine who liked her very much. His name, his name is, no, we, we said it before. Brother Dan. <laughs> so Brother Dan was my evangelist, co-evangelist partner on our, on our team, the anti-messengers. And he would come to me every time and say, boy, I like this girl, but she don't like the best bone in me. He just said, pray for me. Pray for her to like me. So me, for two years, I prayed for him. Two whole years, I prayed for this girl who he's talking about, who I don't know, to like him. The prayer bounced back. <laughs> and so when I met Eutrus, I passed her by. She was my sister's friend. I was 20, she was 17. I had my eyes on somebody else. Hey, let me tell you something. When I was 20, I was one of the hottest, best-looking evangelists in the country. I had so many girls running after me, and I have pictures to prove it. They would take my tie, they would take my Bible, they would take my pen and run away just for me to go after them. I said, Lord, this nonsense has to stop. The next girl I see and I like, I'm going to marry her. Yes, she is. <laughs> but it took me six months of three times a day, one hour each. Lord, is this your will for me? If it is your will, Lord, make it happen because you know, my friend is on the other side. I don't want to hurt him. <laughs> you know, when my father heard that he had liked her, my father said to me, he said, boy, you mean that is what you did to your friend? <laughs> but I had read uh, Martin Luther, the reformer uh, biography. The same thing happened to him. Melanchthon was his friend. And Melanchthon asked him to pray for this girl. Martin Luther ended up marrying the same girl he was praying. So I said I had a book report that conf confirms what I did here, Papa. <laughs> 52 years have gone away. Why? Because I prayed. I prayed it in. I prayed it out.
out and I prayed it through. I had learned how to pray from then on. Praying and fasting was my number one desire. I probably, and this is a humble statement, but some people don't know it. I probably fasted more than anybody in history. Yeah. How? Oh, four times I fasted without eating anything, 120 days. Four times. One time, 109 days. Several times, 90 days. I love fasting. I was strong. Now, last fast was in New York, 1985. November, we were broke. We had nothing, no place to go. I was renting from a friend. It was a basement. It had a broken glass. It was freezing. It had one bulb, no bathroom. If I had to get the bathroom, I had to go upstairs. They shut the door at 10 o'clock. <laughs> I had no money. I was a millionaire back home. I didn't want to go back home. I put in my papers. The attorney sold my package. I would find out later. So I was denied. Can't work. The poor wife had to slave at a Jewish woman's place from 7 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, six days a week, $200. That's what we lived on. And out of that 200, I had to pay my landlord $100 rent for the basement with one light and no facility. And he was my friend. I know about friends. I began to fast. In November, December, January, February, March. Didn't eat a thing. Didn't have anything to eat. Two cups of coffee, that was it. My stomach shrank. But the strength of, and freezing in that basement. Bundles of blankets on me. A wide open basement. But I, I fasted. I prayed. I cried. I begged God. Well, nothing happened during the fast. I broke the fast after 120 days. Got a little job here and there and there, blah, blah, blah. But one year later, Candace was born. The impossible of 18 years. And I didn't pray. In his mercy, heard the prayer Amen. of her. And she said, as she joined me in the fast, this is the last time I'm going to ask God for a child. Listen, I know a little thing about prayer and fasting. Because I serve a big God. I serve a God who created all things and nothing is impossible for him. Learn from the master teacher. Many lessons to learn. If you don't stop loading... And not start learning. If you don't unload, you will break. I'm done. Learn. Learn. 